Shalom everyone, and today we're studying Parashat Emor. And Parashat Emor, the story itself of the parasha, uh, it's on the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, verse 1. I'm sorry, it starts much earlier. That's 20, chapter 21, verse 1. This is about the Kohanim, the priests, about how pure they should become, stay, preserve, observe the purity in order to do the job in the temple. Chapter 23 and on, it's about Shabbat and the rest of the holidays. Now, what's in it for us, uh, all of this stuff? Because it's not the first time the holidays are being discussed. Uh, most of us are not Kohanim, are not related to the Kohanim, to the priestly uh, lineage uh, that served in the temple. And uh, <clears throat> uh, how do we apply to our everyday life? And there's one more thing we have to remember that this is also when we have the most elaborated uh, mitzvah of the counting of the Omer, that Parashat Emor falls just in the middle of the counting of the Omer. Okay, so we see how everything is interconnected. Uh, so let's start from uh, the beginning. And it's like everything is encompassed in the first sentence, first verse, chapter 21, verse 1. Vayomer Adonai el Moshe, Emor el Akoanim. And God says to Moses, Tell the Kohanim, Bnei Aaron, all the ones who are Kohanim, are descendants of Aaron, the high priest. And should say to them, Do not become impure. And there are many issues about the purity and the ability of the Kohen to serve as a Kohen. And as I said, even if you are a Kohen, from a Kohen family, uh, there's no Beit HaMikdash, there's no temple right now. So how does that apply for us today? So we have to remember that when the Torah is speaking about any kind of an issue, there are many layers of interpretation, many layers of hidden wisdom that are hidden in all of those uh, lines in the Torah. So of course, you have the simplistic meaning, but you have also the deeper meanings that we need to connect to in order to get some value from this week, get some messages about what is our spiritual journey, um, what are the visions of a spiritual journey for this week. So uh, we'll, we'll go with, to the Zohar because that makes it much, much easier. And a Zohar Sulam, Parashat Emor, about the same verse that we just read. Amar Rabbi Yose, Mam tam dal lekobel dar, dichtiv leila veish o isha, ki ye baim ov o idoni, mot yumatu, vesamich lei emor el akoanim, ela kevand azar lo li israel lekatcha lo bechola, azar lo lechanei lekatcha lon, vechen alavim lechanei minayin, dichtiv emor el akoanim, lelevai minayin dichtiv velalavim tedaber vamart alem, begin dichtakhu kulan zakain kadishin dachyan. Translation. And God says to Moses, <clears throat> and just the first verse we just read, which means the Kohen, first of all, should really keep himself uh, pure and should not uh, connect to any impurity. So Rabbi Yossi is, uh, is questioning, why is that mentioned over here? While it says above in Parashat Kedushim, Isho Isha ki ebaim ovo idoni mot yumatu. When a person is trying to connect of o idoni, the meaning is when a person is trying to achieve the knowledge of the future through connecting to 
the uh, dark system, how do you know they're connected to the dark system? They're not trying to be pure as the Kohen. And we have to remember something very, very important. The fact that somebody has the powers to tell the future, that does not mean that that person is connected to the real connection. How do we know? You know, the people that have powers, even today, that you go to them and they tell you all kinds of stuff about your future, about your past. They know stuff you, they have no, you have no idea how come they know about it. So the moment somebody can tell you about your past, about your present, about your future, and does that mean that they are connecting to godly inspiration and wisdom and prophecy? And the answer is, according to the Torah, no. How would you know? And the answer is very simple. If the person, like the Kohen, is very, very, and you can see it on that person's behavior, is very, very uh, focused on staying pure, on making everything possible to stay pure, to stay connected to godliness, and he works very strong about his attributes, his behavior, his relationships to people and to God, like it's being explained in Parashat Kedoshim, and now it's being expanded to Parashat Emor, then you know something that is very important. There is a rule in technology, and the rule is that a device cannot deliver a message uh, in a quality beyond its means. I'll explain. Let's say you would like to uh, watch a movie, okay? Now, if the movie is in the highest quality of movies today, in today's technology, can you watch this movie on a, in, on a TV that was made in the 60s or 70s or the 80s? Of course not. Why? Because the device cannot deliver a message in a quality above its own means. Which means only a very high quality device can uh, deliver the message, which means the movie, of very high quality, digital and stuff like this, in, in a, if it's only if it's a very high quality device. And if the device is in a low quality, of course, that device cannot deliver a high quality movie. So, same thing about the person. If a person delivers you a message, okay, and you look at the person, and the person you see is not after purity, the person has no manners, the person is very selfish, the person has no, any, no uh, devotion, towards getting close to godliness, of course that if he delivers you a message, this message did not come from higher places, it came from lower places. Why? That's where the person is. So, if a person is, and that's why it says, all of these people that try to perform like they are great sages, and they give you great wisdom and they tell you about the future. Finally, that will come out in controlling you. Why? Because when a person is in a filthy place without any commitment for spiritual growth, that person will use that pow these powers they somehow manage to get to control you because their motivation is selfish and the result will be they're going to, sooner or later, they're going to use that for their self-interest, which means control you, to control your life, money, stuff like this. Those people were called of Oyedoni in the uh, Torah, which means those were people 
that they were using the dark net in order to perform magic. Magic means to tell you the future, to tell you stuff about yourself that you, that you thought nobody knows. They have powers. You know, where those powers are coming from. The fact that somebody has the power, it does not mean that this power is beneficial. So that has to be really, uh, that has, must be really clear for us that the, that the world has different layers of abilities. And if you want to connect, and as we spoke about it, in the last few weeks, especially since starting reading the book of Leviticus, it's all about getting your calling, purifying ourselves to get the right calling. And if somebody tries to get you a calling and you look at the person, you see that person does not have any commitment for spiritual growth or overcoming their selfishness. Um, how could the message be pure if the deliverer of the message has no intention to become pure? Of course not. That's why Balaam, who was a prophet, but he connected to the dark side. He was making, performing dark magic and he was called a prophet. Yes, he could say things of the future, but that came from a dark place. What was the result? To him and whoever followed him, that was always destruction. Okay, so let's uh, continue with, the, with our message. And then, very important, that's verse 2. Emor al-Kohanim b'nei Aaron, matamacha b'nei Aaron, that was the Aramaic. Zohar, and now the Zohar expands on the same topic and explains to us. And he says, uh, verse 2 in the Torah, uh, no, it's the first verse again. It says, Say or tell the Kohanim, the children of Aaron. And the Zohar is asking, Why should it say, why should the Torah say the children of Aaron? Every word in the Torah is meaningful. There's not one word that is kind of extra, just for the, uh, just to make it nice. Everything is very meaningful and very has a purpose. And the answer is, why does it say Bnei Aaron? Ki Aaron, Aaron is the beginning of all the prophets of the Kohanim of the world. So. Yeah, that could be challenging. It's 33 centuries later, since the days Aaron was nominated or um, anointed to be the high priest. Who says that all those people, and a few hundred thousand of them, still, that they have a tradition that their father was a Kohen, meaning a priest, and their father, his father was a Kohen, and his father was a Kohen, all the way 33 centuries ago to Aaron, the high priest. And I already explained that uh, not long ago, somebody came with the idea, we can check it out. We can test it. If the people who consider, are being considered today in the Jewish nation as Kohanim, you know, some, many of them are being simply called Kohen, uh, last name Kohen. If this is what they're, if they all claim to be, all of them claim to be uh, descendants of Aaron, the high priest. Today, that's very easy to prove. You simply check the DNA 
of sequence of their Y chromosome. Why? The only chromosome that never changes sequences we have 40, 30, 23 chromosomes. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Each pair is made from one chromosome that came from our father, one chromosome that came from our mother. Okay, the last pair of the 23 has XY. X is the chromosome we get from our mother, and the Y, if, I, if you are a man, a, a male, the Y chromosome you got from your father. Okay, they do not, now in every generation, the pair is shuffled, like you're shuffling the two decks of cards, but Y and X, X never shuffle, which means the Y chromosome stays always the same, which means if those people who call themselves Kohanim are really descendants of Aaron the high priest, let's check their Y chromosome sequence and they took a test from hundreds of people claiming to be Kohanim along uh, in uh, Jewish communities in the States, in, in, in Europe, in Israel and they came out with 80% of them having identical Y chromosomes which means 33 centuries later we still, Aaron the high priest, we still can track his descendants. 80% after 33 centuries, this is huge. How can something like this can say, we're talking about 3,300 years later. There's no royal house in the world that claims even in a small little portion of that length. How could that stay? And especially if Jews were wondering, uh, went through so many atrocities, persecutions, you just name it, and still 80% still trace their lineage to Aaron the high prophet, the high, the high priest? This is like, this is illogical. How could that happen? So the Zohar is asking, how did Aaron become the high priest? Why does it say the children of Aaron. And he says like this, because God chose Aaron to be the high priest in order to bring peace to the world. In Hebrew, it's the word shalom. One of the meanings of the word shalom means peace. But peace, we have a word for that in Hebrew. It's called peace also. Same letters. Peyut Samich. But Peyut Samech means not that to bring people in a place in which they are not fighting anymore with each other. Shalom, so peace means not fighting. Shalom comes from the word shalem, a whole. To bring shalom to the world is much harder. To bring people to see each other uh, connected, complementary, that I see the other as completing myself, that's what Shalom means. This is the purpose of Aaron. Okay, and that was his purpose. How? How did God choose Aaron? Because he was bred for that? Because he was the brother of Moses? How did that happen? And the Zohar explains immediately. The ways the behavior of Aaron, his commitment to bring peace to the world, that brought him to that place that God had no other choice but to choose him. So did God have a choice? We have to understand, God is not a, a being of free will. Free will means you have a fight between good or bad, right and wrong. Okay, pure and impure. God is above that. He is the light. He has no uh, free will uh, to give. He's giving. The moment he stops giving, he's not the endless anymore. So how can you call him the endless according to the Kabbalists? So when we say that Aaron 
his actions, his behavior, his choices brought him to become the Kohen. And who is the Kohen? The Kohen, according to the Zohar, is someone who basically connects between the Archangel Michael, Michael, Malach Michael, which is presenting the power of Sefirat Chesed, loving kindness, to be to bring it to this world. All his days, all his days, Aaron was that person that devoted himself, his time, his energy, his knowledge, everything he did to bring peace to the world. What does it mean? The legend is saying that he, like we, we have the, you know, the uh, scriptures would speak about what's behind the stories of the Torah, that Aaron was the one person that he could not stand the idea that two people can't stand each other. If it's a husband and wife, two neighbors, friends, uh, just two people, they had a fight and he would go to one and talk to, to him about the other. And little by little, it will bring them into such compassion, loving, kindness, and good intention, so they'll make peace with each other. So when the story, when that moment came, and there was a need to have a Kohen, it was known all, all over the Israelite nation, if there's one person everybody loves, one person that dedicates himself to bring peace to everybody, that was Aaron. There was no question about it. And that, and because his ways were like this, God brought him up to it. So, is God choosing who to award a priesthood and who to punish? Of course not. God's light flows unconditionally everywhere. That's why the Kabbalists call him the Endless. We, through our actions, we determine how to connect to God's light. So we can, can connect by purifying ourselves, devoting ourselves for higher levels of awareness, transforming our selfishness, which are, we are born with, we can't deny it, into a higher quality. And by this, we choose. That's our choice daily and, some, and every, every, every hour. We have to choose which direction to take. And that can lead us to the, to the, to the road of the Kohen, which means I'm here to, to bring the influence of Archangel Michael, Michael to this world. And that is my goal. And therefore, even those people who are not from a priestly descent, they can choose every day to bring themselves up to that frequency. So that's what's in it for me. What are we here for? What, are, what is our calling? Our calling is to become priests, kohanim, in our home, in our, in our environment, wherever we do the business. So when people interact with us, they will feel from us God's grace, loving kindness flowing. And by this, we raise ourselves to a place of the Kohen. And because Aharon did it in, even from a higher place, he knew the wisdom that the Zohar is explaining. When we are making peace in this physical world, we create peace in the upper worlds too. And when the worlds unite, then the light can flow all over and the result will be, will be more bliss shining in our realm, the realm of the physical uh, body uh, and, and mind. To emphasize that, the Zohar goes into verse 3. Rabbi Yehuda Patach, Rabbi Yehuda opens up, 
And he's quoting from um, Psalms 31. Ma'av tuvcha shetzafanta lirecha. How great is your goodness that you hid, treasured, for the ones who, uh, who have the awe of God. Okay, that's a verse from Psalm 31. This verse is connected to what we just said. Ma'av tuvcha, how great is your goodness and grace, which means this is how great divine, precious, is the divine light that is called good. How do we know? As it says in Genesis chapter 1, Vayar Elohim et kitov, and God saw the light that it was good. And that light, the sages are asking, where is that light? And it's called O Haganuz. In Hebrew, O is light. Haganuz, treasured. This light is treasured. What does it mean treasured? It is hidden. You know, where do you put the treasures? In the marketplace? Now, when we're talking about the treasures of somebody very, very rich, or the treasures of the uh, treasury of the state, you don't put it, you know, in a place everybody can uh, come in and pick whatever they want. You put it in a safe, in cellars, fortified, hidden. Not everybody can have access to those treasures. The same thing is, that's why it's, it, God's light is called treasured. Why? Not everybody can have access to, those, to that light. Why? You need to make the effort to connect to that light. Why? If you have access to endless light, you can really hurt yourself if you don't know how to handle such powerful force. And therefore, we know what happens to people that are being exposed to power. Let's say, take somebody, a nice, decent person, give them a very powerful position in the army, in the government, in a company. I think all of us know what happens when you give people so much power. Power corrupts, okay? So when we have access to power, this power can be also the power that is being revealed when you connect to uh, drugs or alcohol. It's, it is God's power. But because somehow you connect to a, to, through a, uh, of, through a, uh, uh, some kind of a connection that has no valves in it, so you get very high, and then comes a buy, because same thing in electricity. You don't, <coughs> you connect to very high powers without, you know, outside the code. Then you have an explosion and darkness, high a buy, flash and crash. For lots of people, that's the way they live, between the flash and the crash. Why they don't understand? that the universe is wired in a very wise way. You need to follow the rules of the Torah in order to be able to connect to God's network and then you can take the light, God's treasured light, without being burned up. Okay, how do you do that? So, of course, the first rule is never be selfish. When we connect to any kind of power selfishly, uh, then comes a lot of light and the crash is following. You can't avoid it. And what does it mean connecting to the dark network? It's connecting through selfishness, as we said before. Yes, uh, you know, I remember when I was very, very young, there was an article about how come the witches and the warlocks did not take over the world. And the answer is, even if you believe in witchcraft, 
and you believe that there are people who can achieve superpowers by connecting to witchcraft, the witchcraft that is known in the world, you know, shamans, uh, that there's ancient witchcraft all over the world. In many places, it's not that common anymore. In some places, it's still very common. Okay, you see, you realize in countries, this witchcraft is very common. The, the, these countries are always behind. They're always plagued with so much corruption and so many diseases and plagues like uh, nature. It's, uh, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. And they can't move on. And in countries, people are more into decency and morals and values the Torah is talking about. They are much better off economically and all other means of life. So we have to understand, connecting to power, everybody can connect. The question is, which network do you have access to? And that article said, those people who get superpowers, usually they connect to the dark network. And the result is self-destructive. Self-destructive. So if you go around the world and you see those people using power, whoever believes in that. But there is a possibility. And today, thank God, most people don't even know how to do that. Okay? So that what you don't know can harm you, cannot harm you. But in many, many places, people still following that stuff. And even becoming very cool to follow all kinds of ancient uh, wisdom of shamanism and witchcraft that look at those societies, how low those societies stay for generations. What do you think that was by uh, coincidence? No, no, these are the rules. Same thing if you go to the Canaanites, that the Israelites replaced them in the Holy Land of Israel, they simply behave in the same way. So the Torah is telling us today, it's not just the Torah, every place in Israel that you dig and you find Canaanite houses and dwellings, as we read in Parashat uh, Tazria and Metzora, and the Zohar said they had all, all their houses were built on witchcraft. Today, wherever you dig and you find a Canaanite house, you find inside elements of witchcraft. It's built in. It's part of the house. You take, you, every archaeologist uh, in Israel knows that. You just can find those witchcraft tools in every room. Okay, what was the result? They were totally destroyed. Why? God says to Abraham, their crimes are not, did not extinguish them. It's not that the Israelites destroyed the Canaanites. The Canaanites destroyed themselves. And when their, their time was up, the Israelites just had to come and pff, blow it up. Same thing, you know, the Aztecs in uh, Mexico, when they were, that was very high level of witchcraft, and especially, like the Canaanites, human sacrifices. Can't say that was like, you know, uh, nice. It's not nice. Can't do that. And a few hundred Spaniards coming, and they just, poof, and it's over, and the whole empire is falling apart. Their time was up, therefore the Spaniards could take over. That's why when Columbus came to uh, Central America, their time was up already. Otherwise, how come a kingdom of millions of people just fell to a few, few uh, hundred horse riders? You have to understand that history is much more complex than what our eyes uh, see or what we are being conditioned to see. So, when we speak about the divine light, and it says that God saw the light was good, and that's a treasured light, O Haganuz. With that treasured light, God is doing good in this world, which means it is treasured, still, it's still giving life to reality. 
not in unlimited way, but that's the way God is doing good in this world. And nobody, this light flows daily, daily. No one can stop it because without that light, reality cannot continue to exist. And the world is being sustained by that treasured light. So we learned that the divine light that God made when he created the universe, he treasured it to the righteous people, to future to come. But that light is, can be felt in two ways. One is the treasured light for the future time to come, for the tzaddikim, to the righteous, which means all of us when we come to that degree, and we'll explain about it later on. Two is that light that is called good that we can experience in our today's reality. And without that light, nothing can exist. And whenever we experience real good, this is coming, extending from that original light. Verse 4. When the world was created, the world was imbued with that light, shining without any limitation. However, since we know that the world cannot be uh, full with too much light because we are not ready for that because of our selfishness, because he can't give somebody who's not ready endless power and energy. Uh, they can't take it properly. We cannot. Okay, and therefore, most of the light is treasured so we have no access to it. How do we have access to it? As we learned, again, we are now in the time of the counting of the Omer, and we can say counting of the Omer, or we can see it in the hidden message that sefira means counting, but sefira means in Hebrew also illuminating. Omer could be a sheaf of wheat, but it could be also the whiteness of the great spiritual light. So when we say this is a firat omer, it means that the lights of the great light are being shining to the world by us doing our actions of kindness to bring positivity into a world that is full of negativity. And this is our calling. And that's how we heal the world. And basically that's our job. Okay, so now to, in order to explain that, continues the Zohar, I'm, I'm skipping to verse 74 in the Zohar. Velamadnu. Uh, it says that every day of a person's life is like a vessel ready to be fulfilled with light. It's like the moment you wake up in the morning, God is giving you a big empty vessel. says, okay, that's your day. Fill it up. Fill it up with light. How? When, you, when we uh, perform acts of kindness, sharing, giving, loving, overcoming our selfishness, we generate the endless light, we generate an action which draws the endless light into this world, and we fill up that vessel more and more and more till we go to sleep. And when we go to sleep, this is time to, like, do a summary, you know, when, you know, you have a, a working day and you have sales in the, in, the, in the shop, by the end of the week, you do the uh, bottom line. You know, what did we do? And that bottom line becomes an angel, becomes a power. If you fill it up with positive light of grace, it becomes a protective 
angel. If you fill it up with unworthy actions, that becomes a kind of a negative angel. Both angels follow the person that created them to the rest of his life till even to the afterlife. And we learned, verse 74, the action below, which means the actions we make in the physical world, the action below awakens an action above in the world that is unseen. When a person does a proper action in the physical world, which is the world below, so if the action is good, then a good action is being awakened above, a good power. A person is doing grace, kindness to somebody else, then kindness and grace is awakened from above and dwells in that day. The day as a creation. Who is the creator? Me and you, we are the creators. Every day we choose, through our choices, we choose what kind of an angel is going to come out of that day when we go to sleep and the day is over. Oh, and it's not over. The day is completed. Now it becomes an angel that can work with us sometimes forever. So if the person is, is behaving with compassion, that will be energy of compassion. If it's going to be with grace, it's going to be grace. And that day becomes a protective angel if the actions of the person and his intentions were good. Also, verse 75, the opposite is right. If the person is doing an action of cruelty, he awakens a power of cruelty, an angel of cruelty, and that's what this day becomes. It becomes an angel of cruelty. And this day is blemished. And then this day is turning, becoming an angel that turns against his creator. Who is the creator of that angel? The person who performed an act, an act of cruelty. So the way you the way you behave, you're being treated, which means we have to take responsibility for all what's happening to us because these angels stay with us, as I said, almost forever. Why almost? Because why is it that we are learning about the Kohen? Because we're learning that every person should become a Kohen because it's the only way we can eliminate those angels angels that we created who knows in which lifetime and those angels are following us and they hurt us they uh, take re revenge in us because we created them in a negative way so all the angels that we created all the days that are basically angels of blemish hurt pain misery complaint whatever negativity that we generated that is creating unrest and the opposite of peace in the world because those angels they affect not just us they affect the whole world but especially they affect us which means we have to fix them not like this lifetime next lifetime and next lifetime and they just chase us till we fix them till we correct them and we have to take responsibility and acknowledgement that it's not random and it's not because of other people's behavior it's our behavior that creates that uh, um, invitation for negativity and we need instead of being behaving like victims we have to take responsibility and any negativity that we have to deal with, we need to correct it. We need to transform it into chesed. Like the Kohen. What was the power of the Kohen? The power of the Kohen was to, to uh, nullify the judgments. 
to sweeten the judgments, to remove the decrees. How? With love and kindness. And that was the power of the Quran. And that till today, people who are Quranim, they still in Jewish uh, tradition and law, they still have the power to bless the people. So uh, in many, many synagogues, especially all the synagogues in Israel and around the world, depends on the tradition, every morning the Kohanim get in front of those people who have the uh, tradition that they are Kohanim, they go to the front of the synagogue in a certain time of the prayer and they bless the people with the same words of blessing that Aaron used to bless the people in his time. Okay? But that, does that mean that we cannot raise ourselves to the place of the Kohanim? No. It still does not give us an exemption. We have to create that positivity in order to uh, subdue, correct, transform the negative angels that we generate as generated uh, ourselves. Now, uh, in order to understand that, the, the, the Torah is also explaining later on that the Kohen that is blemished, he cannot serve as a Kohen. So the question is, okay, what's in it for us if we are not Kohanim? And Rabbi Ashlag is teaching us an amazing teaching. So that verse in chapter 21, verse 17, if that Kohen has a blemish, he cannot serve as a Kohen. So Rabbi Ashlag is bringing that verse uh, from the Zohar, Parashat Emor also, verse 50, Amar Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yossi said, עתיד הקדוש ברוך הוא להשלים את ישראל שימצאו שלמים בכל, שלא יהיו בהם בעלי מום כלל, משום שיהיה תיקון העולם בעת התחייה. During the time of the resurrection, the resurrection of the dead, when people will get up from their graves, and we have to ask the question, if people have to correct themselves, and that will be the, the messianic days of correction, why do we need the resurrection? What's a resurrection for? Okay, and the answer is when people will be resurrected after the messianic era, there'll be another era of the resurrection. Techiyat Hamitim. When they get up and resurrected, they will get up and the question is with what vessels? What are the garments? What kind of bodies? And it says in Job 38, 14, they'll be getting up like garments. What does it mean? And as I adds, when they wake up resurrected in their coming resurrection, they will get out from the grave the way they came in. If they were that they died without a leg, without a hand, without an ear. That's how they come up. If somebody is, was blind, he will be resurrected blind. The same garment, remember? The body is a garment. Like you change garments, you change bodies. The soul stays the same, the body is changing, like the garment. So the tradition says. The uh, Midrash is saying, why? Why do they have to be resurrected with their blemishes? And the answer is that nobody will say it's a different person that was resurrected. You know, that's, and so after that, God will heal them. So whoever was missing a leg, a new leg will grow for him. Somebody did not have a uh, an eye, the, a new eye will grow healthy eye that has the ability to see. God will heal them. And then the world will be totally complete. So Rabbi Ashlag is saying, it's very, very, uh, you, you can really wonder, what does it mean they will be resurrected with their blemishes? 
So nobody says that there's somebody else. Oh, I knew this guy. It was my neighbor. But my neighbor was missing a leg. It was like, you know, he was sick. He had a lot of scars. This guy, that's not him. He's too beautiful. It's not him. And Rabbi Ashok is asking, so how do, why does God care if somebody said somebody else? <laughs> it's like, God cares about it. And the answer is, Rabbi Ashton is saying like this, during these years of correction, this period of humanity's history, that we are now in the year 5783, okay? Those days were given to us by all the work of spiritual uh, commitment, hard work, transforming ourselves, all of that is to correct our souls. And, but not the body. The body will always be in that chapter of the history of humanity. The body will always stay corrupted. What does it mean? The body is always selfish. All the tikkunim that we do, all the corrections that we do by improving ourselves, they correct the soul. But the body always have the inclination to, uh, to disturb. That is true, to disturb. So we raise our souls to higher levels of holiness and purity. Okay? And just to get closer to God, as we said. And therefore, everybody finally needs to die and to rot in order to eliminate that negativity that the body is that body is the uh, um, extension of that negativity in this world. The body does not receive really a tikkun, but it cannot stay like this. Why? Because if the great, why was the body created? If the body has a huge desire to receive for selfish reasons, that is also a creation of God. What about the correction of the body? And if the body is such a great desire for everything, for all the big pleasures and stuff like this, mental or physical, if this is going to be lost forever, it means that the creation somehow lost the ability to reveal great light that only the body can reveal. And if God created the body to experience pleasure, God needs that pleasure to be revealed. Because you cannot reveal great pleasure if you don't have a desire for that. So therefore, that's what the sages said, when the dead will be resurrected, they will be resurrected with their blemish. What's the real blemish? The real blemish is selfishness of the body. And it has to come back after we fixed all the souls during the 6,000 years of tikkun of humanity. Now we need to resurrect the body, which means that body that we had to control, subjugate, transform all the time. And we are so much afraid during this era that of the 6,000 years from receiving the great pleasure that the body craves for, because that is against the soul, now the resurrection was in order to transform the physical body desire and to kosher it so we can enjoy the greatest pleasures, but in a kosher way without that corrupting us. That is the purpose of the resurrection. And so the question, so now Rabbi Ashlag is saying, so what's the thing that they will say it's someone else? The answer is that everybody will know that the desire to receive on its full extent 
that was created in the beginning, that that created every desire so it can receive and manifest and fulfill God's desire to share pleasure. When we are selfish, we cannot receive that pleasure because the law of affinity says similarities attract. So selfish and endless, that's a two opposite things, impossible for them to be commun communicating without hurting each other. Only the resurrection is going to fix that. So the biggest, the strongest cravings and lust that humans can have, we can also convert them into pure spiritual joy. That will mean it's not another one. It's the same desires, passions that we had, cravings that we had. Now we can, we're powerful enough to transform them so we can receive the biggest pleasure and still not separate ourselves from the source of life. Why? We will learn how to do it in order to share with others. So the whole thing about this, this uh, parasha, and more, is how to awaken that frequency of a Kohen, the angel Michael, Archangel Michael, inside each one of us, taking that commitment. So by doing that, we're basically getting closer to fulfill our calling. Another thing, as we said, uh, chapter 23 was about the holidays. And what are the holidays? The holidays are simply gates beyond time that when we come to Shabbat, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Passover, Purim, Hanukkah, Shavuot, it's all like heavenly gates that open up so we can have a glimpse of the light of the world to come. And they are called Mikra'e Kodesh, which means calling the holiness in. So the holidays are not just days of commemoration. They are days in which the layers that separate us from the divine light are becoming thinner and it's easier to call the holiness in, feel that and realize that we are meant, our calling is to be higher beings that connect to enormous spiritual light and not just to physical selfish joy. Thank you so much and have a great week.